All right, welcome to church this evening. We're glad that you're here. We look forward to this time together as we worship the Lord and we pray. Uh, we, it was always, it was good this morning. So far, our, we had a couple of bird variety visitors this morning. Uh, one was a family and one is still here. Um, and so we're continuing to pray that he stays on the rafter and is not introduced to our fan um, because... It may get him out of here, but it may not be the best thing for anyone else sitting under the fan. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, but let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and uh, we'll start the service this evening. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to once again be here. Lord, we thank you for this morning and the visitors that we had. And Lord, we just thank you that it seems that you keep sending uh, folks our way. And Lord, I pray that you help us as a church to uh, reach out to them, to care for them, to invest um, in them. And Lord, may you continue to grow your church here and help us to continually be obedient uh, to what you've called us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, good evening to everybody. Welcome back to church. Why don't you stand with me tonight? We're going to sing all three verses of Isn't the Love of Jesus Something Wonderful to start with. The story, story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me, boundless as the universe around me, reaching to the furthest soul away, saving, keeping love it was that found me, that is why my heart can truly say, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful, wonderful, oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me. Love beyond our human comprehending, love of God in Christ, how can it be? This will be my theme in never ending, great redeeming love of Calvary. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me? All right, you can take a seat. We're going to carry on singing tonight with nothing but the blood. Let's sing all the verses of this song as well. away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Naught of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fans I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks again for coming out, especially Pastor with your cough and everything. Looking forward to what the Lord has for us later. All right, it's time for the memory verse, and because it's a new month, we've got a new memory verse there, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Let's go through it. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And again, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Amen. May Lord add his blessing to that. Just really interesting to see there that our delight should be in the law of the Lord. And how much of us, how many of us do actually spend our time delighting in the law of the Lord? A bit of a challenge there. Right. I have a helper tonight. And tonight they've been learning in children's church the books of the Bible. And so I asked what they've got up to, and they've got up to Job, all right? So, wait a minute, I'll turn it on. So I've asked Tom if he would come and say his books of the Bible all the way to Job for us. So are we ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Ready? Stop. What? There you go. What's it start with? You're good. You're good. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First Daniel, Second Daniel, First Chronicles, First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Job, Ezra, Ezra, Nehemiah. Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezra, Esther, Job. Good job. All right, go have a seat. And um, it's good to hear them learning the books of the Bible. It's good to hear that they're learning some songs and um, not really able to sing out this evening, but uh, he got volume for me and him combined on nothing but the blood and uh, so we appreciate all the teachers that are investing into the children and many a times when you're involved in children's ministries you think they're not listening right um, just so you know if you're involved in children's ministry and you think they're not listening welcome to being a pastor because many a times you preach and you think people are not listening uh, but they listen more than you think, right? And, and the one way you know that is when you start asking questions or when we go home with him and he starts coming out with all these different things of the books of the Bible and these songs and these verses that he's learned and, and all those types of things. And, you, and I just want to thank you for that. And uh, sometimes you don't always get to see the results of that. Um, but... If you stay in the church long enough and you're faithful long enough, you get to see people 
that you've invested in grow and the Lord move, uh, mold them and shape them and, and you get to see God do things with them and so that's exciting. And so hopefully um, you can be encouraged when you hear stuff like that. A couple of announcements real quick before the last song. On the welcome table, ladies, if you're coming to the ladies event on Friday evening, you really need to let my wife know and make the prepayment for that if you haven't already. <clears throat> so that way all of those arrangements can be made because they don't allow splitting of the bills. So if you do that, then the church can pay one bill and that'll make that easier. There's a number of ladies that are coming out and it looks like it'd be a good time of fellowship and getting to um, spend time with each other. And then also on the welcome table, there's a sign-up sheet for the 10th of November. Um, we, we, November 3rd is Vision Sunday. November 10th was going to be Ministry Involvement Sunday. We're moving that to November 17th. And on November 10th at 9.30, we're going to have a special morning tea because it's somebody's last Sunday with us, from what I know. And uh, the hunters will be there last Sunday, and so we'd like to have a, a morning tea because why? We're Baptists. We like to eat. We like to fellowship, right? And, uh, and before that, that's the most I've heard you say amen in 10 years. Uh, <laughs> food and fellowship, amen. All right. Um, and so it would be a good time just to spend some time together, spend some time with them before they, they head back. And um, so if you'd like to sign up for that, you can sign up to bring something sweet. You can sign up to bring something savory. Um, and we'll just um, put those things out and we'll have a good time of fellowship on the 10th of November um, at 9.30. So come a little bit early for morning tea that day and uh, we'll have a good time um, together. All right. Now, I believe there's one more song before the message. Thanks, Pastor. We're just going to sing O Precious Sight. We'll sing all four verses of this song as well. O precious sight, my Savior stands, dying for me with outstretched hands. O precious sight, I love to gaze, remembering salvation's day, remembering salvation's day. Though my eyes linger on this scene, may passing time and is not still. The power with which it impacts me, the freshness of its mystery, the freshness of its mystery. May I never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross. May I see it like the first time, standing as a sinner lost, and done by mercy, endless, speechless, watching wide-eyed at the cost. May I never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross. Behold the God-man crucified, the perfect sin, the sacrifice, as blood ran down those nails and wood. History was split in two, his history was split in two. Behold the empty wooden tree, his body gone, alive and free. We sing with everlasting joy, for sin and death have been destroyed. Yes, sin and death have been destroyed. May I never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross. May I see like the first time standing as a sinner lost and done by mercy endless speechless watching wide-eyed at the cost may i never lose the wonder the wonder of the cross
right, have your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm not quite sure how you've been praying this afternoon. This morning I said I'll preach, and if my voice stops, then the sermon stops. And so I made it through, and I will we'll say the same thing tonight, um, and we'll see how, how that goes. I'll do my best. Uh, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I know we've been kind of slowly going through this, looking at one or two verses each Sunday evening, tonight we're going to look at three. We're going to, you know, go a little bit fast for the moment, but uh, look at First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16, 17, and 18. It says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, God has a specific plan for our lives, and our priority is following his plan for our life. It should be, right? And Paul is telling us that it's God's will that we practice three habits in life. When we do, they'll have positive consequences on our lives, because every habit has a consequence. Sometimes when we say consequences, we only think of bad things, don't we? I don't know about you, but when I think of consequences, I think of the rod of correction applied to my seat of learning. I don't think of good things. You know, like if you obey, you'll get a chocolate chip picky. Well, that's a consequence, isn't it? Consequences are good and consequences are bad. And there are some habits that Paul says, if you get in your, li in your life then it will be helpful and it will affect you in some ways. Now, I know we've been going a little bit slow through this, and, uh, but that's okay as we, we're not in a rush and we just keep going through these verses and, and seeing what God would have for us. Now, these verses, have you ever played with food coloring? It's really concentrated and it comes in this little bottle. And just a little drop will turn something white into whatever color you drop it in, right? Or just a little drop in water will turn the water into a color. You don't have to dump the whole bottle in to get the little cup of water to turn blue or to turn red or to turn green, do you? Now, sometimes if you're, I know my, my wife in the past has done cake decorating and things of that nature, and it just takes a little drop and the, and the white icing can become blue or it can become orange or it can become whatever color you're trying to make it. Now, sometimes though, you can put a little bit too much of the concentrate in and you know that's happened when you see a bunch of people that are eating like cupcakes or cake and then all of a sudden they smile and everyone's teeth are blue or everyone's teeth are red or everyone's teeth are green. Have you ever been somewhere like that where you know all of a sudden people just start smiling and like everyone's teeth are just a different color? What's happened? They've probably used just a little bit too much coloring, right? Because it's really strong, it's really powerful, it's really concentrated, and only a little drop is all you need. Well, I would say these verses that we're looking at are like that. They're really small, they're really concentrated, but they have big implications in our life. And so as we begin to unpack these this evening, the first thing we're going to look at is three habits that will change your life. Three habits that will change your life. The first habit that will change your life is the habit of joy. The habit of joy. If you look with me at the Bible this evening, it says, rejoice ever more. And, and as, you, as you think about that, it, it's this, this habit of being joyful. Now, sometimes when we think of being joyful, 
We, we don't, we think of, well, you know what? I, I can't, I can't be joyful. You don't know what's going on in my life. There's a difference between joy and happiness. Now, this habit of joy, joy isn't like an escape from what's going on in life. Sometimes, isn't it nice when there's a lot going on in life to be able to just escape from it for a little bit? And whether that's go away and spend the night somewhere and, you know, go away with your family and have a good, you know, just a relaxing time or whether that might be, you know, going on a hike if you like to hike or whether that might be, some of you, it might just be in a room all by yourself with you in a book and reading. And, and it's kind of like an escape from everything that's going on. That's not joy. Okay, joy... It doesn't matter the circumstances that are going on. Our joy doesn't come from circumstances. Our joy comes from who we are in Christ. And he's telling us in this passage of Scripture that we are to be rejoicing ever more. By the way, if someone is joyful, it does not mean they always have a smile. You know, oh, man, joyful people always are smiling. No. Do you understand that you can be joyful and going through something that is really not something you'd smile at? But it's the attitude we have going through life. And, and he's trying to remind them, hey, this habit of joy is necessary. You say, what do you mean it's, it's not always a smile but an attitude? Take your Bible, hold your place here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and go with me to the book of Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Look at me, verse 20 and verse 21. Then Job arose and rent his mantle. By the way, the preceding this is when Job lost all his cattle. He lost his children. He lost everything. Okay? Here's what he says. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now if you read that, I read a joyful broken man. Someone who could still find joy in his relationship with God, but I don't imagine in my mind's eye Job smiling while he says this. Do you? I don't. But, but can you read the, the confidence he has, the, the habit of rejoicing evermore, of no matter what's going on? He said, the scripture there tells us, even in the midst of all that was going on, yes, he was mourning. Yes, he shaved his head. Yes, he rent his clothes. Yes, he did all those things. But did you catch what he did? He worshipped God. He stopped everything. And you know what? I'm just going to take some time, and I'm going to rejoice evermore. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to have this habit even when it's not easy. You know, if you develop a habit, it's not always easy to do habits, is it? No. But if you do them enough, they become second nature, don't they? And as he's looking at this habit of joy, we can see that we can be joyful even in, in the mixture of life. Do you know what joy can be mixed with grief? You say, what do you mean? Take your Bible, look at 1 Peter chapter 1. One Peter chapter 1, and let's look at verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. When Peter's talking to the, the, the audience of this book, it's getting close. It's 
Stay up there, buddy. Good job. <laughs> All the chair shifts to the right. If you're watching online, we have a friendly visitor sitting up in the lot rafters just waiting to joyfully express to us his presence being here. Um, anyways, um, and so as you look at that, he's talking to these believers who are going through difficulty. They're going through hard times. But what he's challenging them to do is, to, but where he greatly rejoiced, though now for a season. In the book of Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk chapter 3, Verse, <clears throat> verse 17. <clears throat> he says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stall. Sounds like a wonderful time of life, doesn't it? Everything's gone. But what habit does Habakkuk have? Look at verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Do you understand? The habit of joy can take place no matter what's going on. It's not regarding the circumstance of life. It's regarding to our relationship with God. Second habit that we that will change our lives, not just the habit of joy, but the habit of prayer. The habit of prayer. Back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, pray without ceasing. Now, as you develop your prayer life, this is pray without ceasing. Now, it does not mean your life is one solid prayer. Pray without ceasing. That means when I pray, I never say amen. I just keep praying. No, but you should always be in a place where you can pray at any time, at any moment, for anything. And as we begin to think about this, you know what? It moves prayer from being a ritual to being a conversation. It moves it from being just simply a request to sharing your thoughts and your hearts with God. It moves from, it, you can just be interceding for others. It can be spiritual warfare. It can be thanksgiving. It can be praise. It can be confession. And yes, sometimes, have you ever read a prayer in the Bible where someone actually complained to God? Have you ever read Psalm? There are sometimes David just complained to God. And sometimes I've heard people say, well, you shouldn't pray that way. Is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. Do you think God understands? Sometimes it's hard not to complain about what's going on in life. But God's saying, you know what? Pray without ceasing. Have a habit of bringing your thoughts to me. And I've had some people say, well, I could never express that thought to God. What would he think? Do we or do we not believe that God knows everything? So whether you express that thought to an all-knowing God or not, do you think he might already know? But here's one thing I've learned the, the older my children have gotten. Uh, when, when Brianna married Andy, we were down at the altar, and I was standing there, and we were arm in arm. And um, you know, the minister is supposed to say, who gives this bride to be married, right? Well, when I was standing there with Brianna, no one asked me. So I just stood there. And the whole thing just kind of stopped. And the, the minister looked at me. And I looked at him. And he looked at me. And I looked at him. And Brianna elbows me. And I'm like, he ain't asked nothing yet. And so we stood there. And it was finally someone tapped the minister and said, who gives this bride away? And the, oh, 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 who gives this bride away? And you say, what did I do? I said, well, now that you asked, her mother and I do. 
And at that moment in time, Andy came over and I took Brianna's arm and I put it, I gave it to Andy. And you know what? At that moment in time, guess what Brianna became? Andy's problem, not mine. I gave her away. Now I'm not trying to be mean by that. But here's one thing I've learned in a father-child relationship, okay? Well, when I gave her to him to be married, you give her away. That's what they ask, isn't it? Well, then as, as the relationship continues to grow and you begin to, to know them, like, there are things I would love to do for them and I'd love to help them with. And sometimes my daughter gets a little bit frustrated because my daughter understands the relationship of when she became an adult and she became older, if she needed something, all she had to do was ask, right? And if she asked, I would do everything in my power to help her. But if she didn't ask, guess what I didn't do? I didn't step in. I didn't interfere. And so recently, they were looking for something, and my daughters, I find out, said to my son-in-law, you know, Dad probably has some photos of us serving when we were at New Beginnings. And he said, uh-huh. And said, and you know, he would give them to you to use in our presentation. And he said, he would? And she says, but you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to ask him. Because he's not going to tell you you need these. And you're going to have to ask him. And guess what? Eventually, we were on a phone call. And I heard in the background, well, are you going to ask or not? And I said, Andy, mate, what are you supposed to be asking me for? Now, I know what he's supposed to be asking me for because all along, Brianna's been telling me we need photos. By the way, I already had the photos all together in a folder just waiting to give them to him. And they, and they said, he said, oh, well, you know, um, mm, um, we, we're kind of short on photos of us in the ministry. And, oh, I have some that I put in our 10-year anniversary. Would you like them? Oh, yes, I'd love them. But I've got to get them, but I've also got to get them to Daniel because Daniel's doing our presentation, and he's in Sydney, and we're in West Virginia, and you're in Brisbane. I said, how about this? Would you like me to create a group that has me and you and Daniel in it, and then when I send the photo to you, I'll also be sending it to him? And he goes, oh, if you could do that, that would be wonderful. And you know what happened within five minutes? The photos were done. And my daughter looked at him and said, now was that so hard? You could always, you could imagine Brianna, now was that so hard? But here's the thing. And I'm sharing that with you and we're laughing at it and we understand the situation. But how often is that us with God? God knows our needs, you know, well, if God knows our needs, he knows what I want, why do I have to ask? Because, like any father, they want to help, but you have to be asked. That's why he's saying, hey, pray without ceasing. Just ask. Just talk with me. Just um, fellowship with me. Now, what's interesting kind of fitting. I began to look into that phrase, pray without ceasing. And you know what I found? When you go back into the original Greek that that was translated from, the Greek writers used that without ceasing of all things to describe a hacking cough. I could say, have you ever known someone to have a hacking cough? And you'd be like, yes, I'm looking at someone right now. And that idea of pray without ceasing, if you have one of those hacking type of coughs and you've ever tried to lay down, you get an understanding, hey, think about it. 
You lay down, and what happens? You go into a coffin fit, and you can't stop. And you keep... <laughs> Don't want to imitate too much, because, or I'll be in a hacking coffin fit. All right? That is the phrase, without ceasing, that God wants our prayer life to be. One of those that once it gets started, it just flows. Now, it's a lot more positive than a hacking cough, okay? Uh, but think about that. The next time you start coughing, and, and, you, and it, this is continual, think, hey, this is what Thessalonians says my prayer life should be. It should be a constant, continual, flowing thing. Now, third habit. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The third habit is the habit of thankfulness. Thanks is something you give to God. I'm going to shock you to say, there we go. God doesn't need you, and God doesn't need me. But everything we have comes from him. So how can we really give him anything? Well, one of the things you can give him is gratitude and thanks for what he's given you. Hey, we're all alive. We're all breathing. We can be grateful for the life God's given us, the family that God's given us, the job he's given us, all these different things. Not necessarily because of circumstances. Sometimes our thanks is to God for having him to be there with us through the situation. Hey, you know, we can be in difficult circumstances, but the thing that we can be thankful is, and lo, I am with you always, always. I will never leave thee nor Safety. Hey, whatever you're facing, guess who you're facing it with? You're facing it with God. And you know what he's saying? In everything, give thanks. Hey, there's very few things in the Bible where it says, this is the will of God. You know, people say, I wonder what the will of God is. Well, I'm going to tell you what the will of God is. In everything, give thanks. But that's too easy. It's not rocket science. If the Bible says the will of this is the will of God, guess what the will of God is? It's give thanks. It's that simple. When we become discontent, what that is is the exact opposite of thankfulness. Joy and thanksgiving go hand in hand. You have to have joy to be able to be thankful. Out of the joy comes our thanksgiving. Now, what are the benefits of these habits? Well, <clears throat> one of the benefits of, the ha of these three habits is better worship. In a sense, these three commands, rejoicing, prayer, and giving thanks, boil down to prayer and praise. Prayer and praise. And what is really worshiping God? Prayer and and praise. For some reason, we've got this weird idea that we've come to a worship service. Do you understand? You don't have to come to where it's designated as church to be able to worship God. You can worship God wherever you are. In any situation you're in. And, uh, and, and we can work, have better worship. Second thing we can have is a better testimony. People all around you are crying out for genuine joy in life. Not just a superficial image. They want the real thing. And guess what? When people see real joy in your life, they know it. They recognize it. And when they see it, they want to know about it. Have you ever been going through something and someone said, how can you be going through that and still be joyful? You know what that's an opportunity to do? That's an opportunity to have a better testimony. And say, you know what? Yeah, it's difficult, but the, uh, I have joy because I know Christ is my Savior. 
not only a better testimony, but <clears throat> more contentment. A lack of thankfulness often comes from a concept known as depravity. You know what depravity is? I want more. I want me, 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 me. And you know what? The more thankful we are, have you ever noticed the more thankful you are to people, the more content your life seems to be? Because when you're thankful, you're thankful for what you have. You're not looking at what you want, right? You're not looking at what you don't have. You're looking at what you have and saying, God, I'm thankful for that. You also have better relationships. Say negative attitudes destroy relationships. People enjoy being around people that are uplifting. Do they not? Have you ever been around someone that, like, the minute they walk into the room, it's just like, oh. everything's just going to go negative. Hey. People want to be around uplifting people, and guess what they want to do? They want to avoid whingers and complainers. Don't you? That's just the way it is. But you know what? If you're joyful, if you're prayerful, and if you're thankful, guess what you do a whole lot less of? Whinging and complaining. It's hard to be joyful and be like, I... It's hard to be thankful and be a complainer, isn't it? They're the opposite of each other. And Paul is trying to encourage them in this. And he informs us that this is God's will that we practice these three habits. And these are the consequences that happen if you practice. Hey, it's difficult to pray the Lord and rejoice in the Lord if you don't know him. But if you know him... It should be really easy to pray to him, to be thankful to him, to rejoice in all that he's done for you. So I'm going to ask you this evening, if we were to ask the people around your life, would these three verses describe you? Joyful, prayerful, thankful. If not, why not? That is God's will for your life. God wants you to be a joyful Christian. He wants you to rejoice evermore. He wants you to pray without ceasing. And he wants you to, in everything, give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to once again to be in your house. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be Christians that develop these habits in our lives, Lord, so that way we can make a better impact for you and not just that, Lord, but what we say and how we live our life can be a match. And I pray, Lord, that we can be an impact by what, how we live our lives. Lord, may we be a testimony for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Right, we'll just sing one more song tonight. We're going to sing Jesus Paid It All. Let's just sing the first verse and the third verse tonight. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, for nothing could have I, whereby thy grace to claim, how my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left
after crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Evening, and uh, we look forward to Wednesday evening. We're going to be having Brother Panera with, <coughs> with us, and so he'll be sharing a challenge and giving us an update on the uh, church plant in Mackay and all that's going on there. So we look forward to at seven o'clock um, via Zoom to have that as well. And then next, and then this Friday evening is the ladies' dinner. And so please um, finalize things like that with my, with my wife, so that way you can be ready for that on Friday evening. Do sign up for the, um, the morning tea on the 10th of November as well. And I believe it's, is it this Saturday? I think this Saturday is letterboxing, or is it next Saturday? It's on the next Saturday? This Saturday. This Saturday is letterboxing. And so... Um, if you're able to be there, please sign up. I'll send out a text to let you know where. Maybe you say, you know what, I can't be there at that time, but I'd like to go out another time. Um, that's fine. I can get you a map. I can get you some tracks, and you can go out, whatever works in your schedule, um, and you can do that as well. All right? So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to once again assemble together and be challenged for your word. I pray now as we go from this place that we can be a witness for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.